Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar express, The Rise of the Metahumans, with our guest speakers, Virginia Bray, who is co-founder and senior director of Marketing Fusion, Roy Kamani, creative director at Cube, and Guy Gadney, who is co-founder and CEO of Charisma. If you're a university student attending today's webinar, then you may want to sign up to the CIM Marketing Club. All you need to do is hover your camera over the QR code you can see on the screen, and that will take you through to the sign-up page. Marketing Club will keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations, and concepts in the marketing industry, so it really is worth taking a look. So I'd now like to introduce our first guest speaker, co-founder and senior director of Marketing Fusion, Virginia Bray. Over to you, Virginia. Thank you, Judith. Um, really, really very excited to be here and so thrilled uh, that so many people have decided to join us today to learn about a topic uh, that we see has got an enormous potential for us all as marketers. Um, firstly, I'd just like to introduce my co-panelists. Um, as Judith mentioned, uh, Roy Kamani is Creative Director at Cube. Um, they're a multi-award multi winning video animation and photography agency and our long-standing partners. Um, these guys are really at the forefront of the latest virtual production techniques and technologies. So it'd be really exciting to hear from, from Roy. Um, and also Guy Gadney, who's got uh, a long degree and pedigree in the entertainment sector and is running Charisma Entertainment. Really exciting platform that's using machine learning to power virtual characters and interactive narrative experiences. So really looking forward to both, in, both of those sessions. Um, and then just to briefly introduce myself, um, I'm Virginia Bray, co-founder of Marketing Fusion. Uh, we're a content marketing consultancy and agency, um, so we help our clients to engage and connect with their audiences um, to drive uh, demand and, and to build relationships. So quickly, um, just touching on the agenda, um, because of the format today, which is um, obviously fantastic to have an opportunity to do a, an express webinar with, with CIM, we're very delighted to have uh, to be involved in that. Um, but we are going to have a fairly tight time frame. So what we're going to suggest is that, um, you know, obviously we'll cover as much as we can uh, on the session today. Um, and, but for those of you that do want to maybe learn a little bit more and um, maybe find out and take this to the next level, see some interactive demos, etc. Uh, there'll be a QR, QR code on some of the slides um, and at the end that will take you to a page where you can register uh, for one of our interactive workshops, which will be limited um, places, um, but please do register if you're interested in, in joining one of those sessions. So briefly, as I said, um, my session today is all about what I see as the opportunity for marketers from this, you know, these amazing new technologies. Um, and one of the things to point out is that we are really at the start of this journey. So, um, you know, with 3D virtual production, with digital humans, it's very much, um, you know, we're at the early stages of those uh, initiatives. Um, so I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about some of the technologies and trends that we, we're seeing around us. Um, and then I can sort of touch on how that links in, I think, to, to some of the marketing opportunities that that presents. So obviously all around us, um, we're seeing a huge amount of um, advances in technology, in particular in the area of real-time 3D and virtual production, um, things like Unreal Engine 5 from Epic Games and some of the other uh, gaming platforms that you'll, you'll be, we'll be touching on later, are really sort of bringing together the virtual world and the real world. So I don't know if people have seen things like The Matrix Awakens, which is an Unreal Engine 5 experience. That kind of gives you a glimpse for how these, you know, the potential that this capability, that these technologies give us to build these virtual worlds. Um, you know, obviously for movie makers and gamers, fantastic. Um, but for marketers, it's actually giving us the opportunity to create much more powerful stories, pretty much in any environment that we choose to create. And actually there's some, you know, a whole bunch of tools that are being made available to us, some pre-scanned environments. So, you know, we don't have to set our stories in the places that we're, we're familiar with. They can be wherever we want them to be. And, and similarly with the characters. Um, another trend that we see is around virtual influences. So uh, some of these, um, you know, people might think of, of uh, influences in terms of, you know, the Kardashians or, or the Rock and, and people like that obviously have these vast social media followers. Um, but take a look at some of the virtual influences that are starting to gain real strong popularity in the marketplace. So um, this lady is uh, someone called Lil Michaela, 
think she has something like 3 million followers on Instagram. Um, some of them are being created by brands themselves. Uh, so you'll see some of the examples of that in a few minutes. Others are being created by effectively creators um, with a specific audience um, that they're designed to appeal to. Um, brands like Samsung, Puma, Alibaba, etc. Lots of brands are actually um, engaging with these virtual influencers who some, in some cases have their own kind of PR agencies and you know to a certain extent they are they are real people. Um, and just to give you a bit of a flavor of the, the value, um, I think um, one of them's got, the, the, there's a stable of um, virtual influencers um, that, that are sort of part of this group with um, Michaela and they've, they've got a market valuation of around $125 million. Uh, so this is not small change. AI is, is obviously um, around us and I'm not going to touch on that too much because obviously in Guy's session shortly you'll learn a lot more about that than, than I can tell you. Um, I suppose with AI, and it's again it's been around for some time, um, having those conversations and, and computers being able to engage with this is, 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 is been around for some while, but what's been missing perhaps is the human um, interaction element of it and being able to put a you know, human face on AI. Uh, so that's what I think is going to be important to see um, coming down track. And then finally, um, you know, you'd have to have your head in the bucket if you didn't um, know about the metaverse. It's it's really here. Um, I think you know lots of brands are starting to explore the potential, or are they already doing it? Um, uh, you know, if you take the definition of the metaverse as being the internet in 3D, it does give us some of the sort of idea of the scale and scope of what it can do. And by 2020, 2030, it's going to be worth something like 13 trillion. So, so that's a huge potential that we need to sort of get our heads around. Um, and just briefly, I also wanted to touch on some of the things that we're seeing from the marketing side of things. So as marketers, we're all under, you know, there's an enormous opportunity, but there's also an enormous amount of pressure, I suppose, more than ever before to deliver some of these really sort of um, personalized um, experiences to create more visual engagement, um, to drive, for example, um, the opportunity for certainly sort of, you know, decision makers that are coming through the ranks um, and coming up from sort of, you know, uh, to, to actually be able to drive their own um, experiences. So how can we enable those kind of things? How can we stay relevant? How can we create this differentiation, differentiation and this cut through? It's a huge challenge and it's one that we obviously are dealing with and working with um, our clients with on a, on a daily basis. How can we create more one-to-one -one connections, capture attention, capture engagement? How can we tell stories and build these long-lasting relationships? It's creating a massive challenge, but it's, you know, the other aspect of that is the fact that we need to be able to do this, not only at scale, but we need to be able to do it in multiple languages and in multiple environments. Um, so potentially creating a massive, huge need for, for content. Um, but effectively, it's also creating for us a perfect storm of opportunity. So MetaHuman is powered by AI. Give us some opportunity to address some of those challenges. Um, we can create and scale stories. We can do that in a highly efficient way. And you're just going to get a bit of a flavor of, of some of those things today. So we're starting to see um, digital humans being used in social media. Um, you see the Prada example that I think Roy's going to touch on later. Um, in live events where you, you have sort of live people interacting with digital characters uh, in, a, in a, um, an event environment. Um, and these interactive experiences, which I think are also uh, going to be massive. Think about, I mean, this is a literal onboarding from Qatar Airways, but think about customer onboarding. How can you actually interact and create this engagement um, with your prospects and customers? Guide them through your, um, you know, through your environment, through the things that you need them to learn, have interactions with them, give them control. You know, enormous potential in in a lot of different aspects, whether that be in campaigns, in countless marketing to create these personalised experiences, um, you know, website concierge, etc. Um, and I think the next session in, that I'm going to hand over now to Roy is to actually give you some more deeper insight into some of those um, elements. So, Roy, I think the control's with you now to uh, to move the slides on to your, your next slide. No worries. Thank you very much for that, Virginia. Um, yeah, so 
brief introduction uh, about myself. Um, I'm Roy Kimani, um, one of the co-founders and creative directors here at Cube. And um, yeah, I'll be telling you a bit more about what MetaHumans are. So, um, so here at Cube, so we kind of um, have our approach to any new emerging sort of technology is to really look at what those things enable us to do as content creators and even taking it a step further is um, because just because of the nature of our business, we work with a lot of um, marketeers such as Virginia and Marketing Fusion um, is to kind of see, okay, what does um, technologies enable us to do and what is it that can be taken from them that could be useful from a marketing point of view. Um, now we know that the whole metaverse and term is a bit of a buzzword now, um, but these these metaverses, so to speak, have existed for a long time. Um, anyone who's familiar with gaming will know of a um, metaverse-esque um, sort of environment where you play games. I have the, you know, the most well-known is Fortnite. Uh, but yeah, if you play any game online or you put some on some headsets and you speak to someone on the other side of the world, that gaming experience that you find yourself in is a metaverse. And we'll now look into a bit more detail about what um, these metahumans are. So yeah, in, in a nutshell, a, a metahuman is a photorealistic uh, 3D human character. Now, these metas, um, or th rather 3D assets, have always existed um, as long, you know, as far back as the beginning of CGI. So um, in movie making, um, in game development, the, you know, the term metahuman is quite commonly used because these are the kind of building blocks to which a character um, will, be built, will be built from. Um, but what has happened is, again, uh, which I'll touch on um, on the next couple of slides, is there's been an, an advancement in a particular technology that has now kind of democratized um, a lot of these 3D assets, um, which basically means anyone can access them now. Um, you don't have to be a game developer or you know work in film um, to be able to utilize these 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 humans. So, seeing what um, um, how good these meta humans have become and how accessible. Um, they are at the moment um, kind of raises the question of what I was saying earlier is okay so from a marketing point of view how can we take these these assets and do something exciting with them uh, for not only ourselves but maybe even for some of our clients so we see this as a really unique opportunity and essentially what has happened is um, that these new technologies have democratized the sort of landscape um, of, of sort of 3D um, assets, um, kind of like what Instagram did to photography. You know, when Instagram first came out, everyone assumed, you know, that there'll be no place for a photographer. Uh, but all that all really did is pretty much, especially with the advancements of smartphones and cameras, it's basically anyone can be a photographer now, but, you know, okay, not everyone has the art of photography within them. but you know, you turn up your phone now and you see all these assets being shared. And, you know, all of a sudden, every, each and every brand had their own page um, to try and take advantage of this uptake that people um, have from, from consuming content. So that exact same thing is happening with MetaHumans. Um, so this uh, points that uh, Virginia touched on um, earlier, um, how can we use these MetaHumans? So any sort of output outlet, so whether it be social media um, or you know, off your company website, um, these are avenues from which you can utilize these assets um, just on, on the get-go. And the exciting thing about these MetaHumans, which I'll, I'll explore uh, in a bit more detail, is the fact that you can now fully customize them and use them for whatever it is that you see fit. Um, and then in addition to that, we've got to start thinking about the, you know, okay, so if I'm to utilize this meta humans, what benefits are there actually to me? Um, some of these Virginia mentioned, but the ones I wanted to particularly touch on um, are the last two, uh, which is localization and inclusivity. So localization in the sense that if you just create these asset um, and for example, um, make it speak, um, you know, you could have it 
uh, one user case that we're looking at is it could be it could deliver say a company wide message for a you know a global brand with multiple um, geographical locations that they need to address so you could do one in English and guy may even touch with this um, but you can also make it speak another language through things like AI so the people for example if I want to put out a video and it needs to go out to China I can just record one message in English and the meta human will communicate that but if it needs to go to China we go okay maybe you should speak Chinese now and if it is getting to the point where it'll just be a quick click of a button and all of a sudden you have you know this message being delivered in a language that is you know local to the people that are targeted towards it um and you know you don't have to at least like for us uh, create like multiple subtitles of you know let's say like 10 20 different videos because they're going to 20 different locations so that's a really big benefit um Another thing is also inclusivity, which is a big topic um, across the world. Um, but a, a meta-human can essentially be anyone and everyone. So you can have one that's Caucasian or black or Asian. It could be tall, skinny, um, fat, thin. It, there's no limit. Um, the only limit really is your, create, is your creativity. But the fact that um, from the get-go, you have this asset that can tick all the boxes for you is extremely um, exciting for us. Um, so, where can you find these meta humans? Um, there's a couple of platforms out there, but the ones that are most familiar uh, to us are Unreal, CryEngine, and Unity. Um, I'll focus specifically on Unreal, and reason being is because you can um, go onto the website um, to the meta human creator and actually now have a go at, at these at creating your own meta human. Um, and what the MetaHuman Creator essentially is, it's a platform that allows you to customize these assets. However, if you, if you go onto the platform, um, please feel free to do so, sign up using your email address. Um, you'll be able to have the option to pretty much fully customize this human. Um, and it can be a bit creepy because they're very photo real, but it is, it is exciting. You can change anything. You could, you could even try and make yourself. Um, I've seen a couple of people who've done so and use it as their, LinkedIn uh, profile pictures, but um, yeah, the yeah the opportunity is there, and it's very easy to use, very intuitive. Please, by all means, have, give it a go. We talked about user cases, uh, but Gina did mention it, but specifically, I think it's because it it's it's a very um, new, I guess, partly techy sort of area. So you know, there's a stigma that oh, how can I actually apply this? And one quick and easy way. Um, is to kind of think of these people, this meta human, sorry, as you know, these this virtual influences. And what we've found really is so the uptake of the meta humans in marketing is really um, China, South Korea, and Japan are at the forefront. Um, but you know, they have agencies, talent agencies for these digital assets, and they kind of hire them out uh, based on you know whatever preference you may have, you know, you're looking for a particular person or this is a particular audience. Um, so people are, not, are now trying to see, you know, how can we actually essentially make money out of these things, not in an exploited manner, but rather um, relevant to us as marketeers. Is, is there a way um, we can take these assets, give them a personality um, and have them, you know, push out content or promote certain products or services. Um, so it is happening. Um, uh, the West is kind of slower to catch on, but a lot of these tech trends do seem to start in Asia and then slowly trickle in uh, into the West. A good example um, of a, a well-known brand that's taken up a virtual character in their marketing is L'Oreal as collaboration with Prada. So this particular I guess meta human is specific to uh, Prada and L'Oreal's collaboration to sell this product. Um, now, one thing to mention is, if 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 you're a brand or business and you're looking to utilize this meta humans, it is um, it's important to kind of really think through it almost as you would a sort of branding exercise for your for your company. Um, if you are to you know associate yourself with a meta human or create your own. What does that asset look like um, in terms of, you know, what does it say about your brand? We've seen some examples um, out there 
um, that haven't been the best executed, but you can easily see when a company is trying to associate with this sort of new thing and kind of executing it poorly and it starts to look gimmicky. Like it's just something that they think, oh, we'll create a quick buzz and see what everyone says. But because of the poor execution, it seems to get a lot of backlash uh, as opposed to any benefit. Um, so wrong kind of attention. Whereas with L'Oreal here um, and Prada, you can really see that it's it's been completely thought through. I mean, it's, it's evident that it's not a real person. It's not looking to replace a, a real human model. But if anything, you know, you have the purple eyes, the pink lipstick, the color, it's, it's, it's a branded asset associated with this product. Um, and this is just a summary of all the other things we've been talking about. Um, I won't run through everything, but yeah, um, some, some interesting stats are any sort of um, brand that's utilized meta humans have really seen, you know, an, a significant uptake um, in terms of just engagement, um, people, wanting to know what's this, what's this thing that's associated with their product or service. Um, it is a lot cheaper sometimes than perhaps maybe hiring a real influencer. Um, you know, if you have these sort of assets, they, you know, they can be superimposed into some of your event um, photography, such as this one here on your top right, or they could be product endorsers, um, like the bomb left, which is, um, I think that thing is a campaign for Porsche, uh, and they've employed this meta human to be their sort of race car ambassador, which is kind of cool. But yeah, that's sort of the end of my presentation. I pass it on to Guy now. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming along on Monday. Um, while we have talked a little bit about how good meta humans can look, we at Charisma want to focus on how good they feel. So in essence, what Charisma is doing is it's, 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 its engine, our engine, is the mind, heart and soul of MetaHumans. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, please do. These are my details, uh, which will be up at the end of, the, end of the, this presentation as well. So what we do really is we power charismatic digital humans. So these are not, these are not the characters that you uh, might see as a sort of standard chatbot. In, with our characters, you can talk to them, voice in, they talk back, voice out, and uh, what you say to them has, a, has actually an emotional impact on it, on them. So they react to you uh, and you react back. And what that allows is for a sense of relationship to build up. Um, and they look stunning. You know, the meta humans look fantastic. Ready Player Me's look great. There are plenty of other fantastic uh, organizations such as Ziva Dynamics, who were recently acquired by Unity, Hyperreal, Unique. These companies are building wonderful, wonderful looking uh, digital humans. And what we want to do is, is power them. And we want to power them because brands need that power. If you are a brand, you want to be a brand that a, a consumer can have a relationship with. You want to be a brand that is interesting to your to consumers, um, not sort of uh, dry and dull. So that's what we where where we uh, come into the mix. And to cover off a couple of use cases, firstly, you know I think that stage one in the digital human market is as a guide. Um, in, in some ways, what you've got is you've got an opportunity now to blend the role of a brand ambassador, a sales director, and a call center operative, all into one individual who, uh, who can communicate with the consumer, manage the relationship with the brand, uh, and engage with them. So this, uh, this is an example from, from Unique. Uh, you know, these are, these are realistic, uh, as Roy said, diverse and, um, and, ve and very flexible characters who just make you that one step closer to, to consumers. Um, in the MetaHuman space, we were fortunate enough to get, uh, to be awarded a, an Epic Mega Grant by Epic Games who make MetaHumans in, in January. And what this enabled us to do was to bridge the gap, create a plug-in between, between Unreal Engine as a 3D games engine and um, and Charisma, we already have Unity in there, but the Unreal one, especially with, with MetaHumans, is important for us because of the level of fidelity and detail, visual uh, fidelity that you can get out of these MetaHumans. 
So what this means is, that, as Roy said, it's, it's easy to create these metahumans and the metahuman creator, but then you want to bring them to life and get them to do something. Uh, and that pipeline for us is has to be very uh, fast. You want to be spinning these sorts of characters up in, in minutes rather than days. Um, and they need to be customizable. So one of the first questions we get asked was, great, you know, what, what do they speak? What voice can, do they speak? Well, out of the box, we have um, in the drop-down menu, I think over 500 voices from various different voice partners. Or uh, as I did a couple of weeks ago, capture my own voice um, and, and put it into a character because it's, in, you know, you've got to, I suppose you've got to walk the walk as well as talking the talk. Uh, but it was interesting to see how it felt for me, which was fine, I found it quite fun. And then um, friends and family to, to see if they, they could spot the real me versus the, um, the, uh, the AI one. So we take this to a number of different industries, whether it's education, teaching kids, you know, with virtual versions of Romeo and Juliet, through brands for marketing campaigns uh, as, as a way to reach new markets, through to uh, marketing campaigns for people like Warner Brothers bringing to life existing virtual production assets, such as Steppenwolf, as we did here. And he's looking directly at you. He's talking directly to you. You are having a conversation directly back to him. And what you say changes, in this instance, the, uh, the fate of planet Earth. So there's a whole story that, that goes around this. And our view always is that what story does to, a, to an experience is it provides an element of direction to it. So it's not just a Q&A but is uh, where you're popping in and popping out super quickly. It's something where you are engaging for much longer periods of time. Uh, and for example, you know, a standard chatbot experience should be, some, should be very short, should be between 30 seconds and a minute. Whereas the sort of level of engagement we want from a brand where you're properly engaging with that brand should be you know, uh, sort of 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, their proper entertainment experiences. Um, and the way to do this, you know, this is not easy. It's, been, it's taken us a while to build Charisma into the way that we wanted to build it. And it needs certain types of bespoke machine learning, uh, natural language processing to recognize what people are saying. And, uh, and indeed, you know, generative AI, new forms of AI such as GPT-3, which we, which we are gently infusing into the process to make sure that, you know, side questions which are brought up can be answered in, in real time and dynamically, as well as from a, from a core script. And as we head into the metaverse world with places like Decentralized and Decentraland and, um, and indeed as Roy said, you know, Unreal Engine, which is certainly a metaverse platform, uh, we want to be there because the worst, the worst thing that could happen in a metaverse is for it to be empty. It's like walking into an empty, uh, an empty party or an empty warehouse. The first thing you want to do is get the hell out as fast as you possibly can. So for those places to be automatically populated with, with uh, AI humans 24-7 is, is actually a critical foundation. It's not a nice to have. Um, so with us, you know, we, we have, as I said, over 250. It's actually now over 500 over the weekend, which is nice because we added a new partner. Um, you have unlimited characters. So what we're seeing as use cases at the moment tends to be one-to-one -one, where I'm talking to one other individual, but it's much more fun, much more engaging if there are two or more characters uh, in the experience that you're talking to. Um, we're looking at custom voice prints, as I said, with, with, with myself and, and others as we've done for Sky TV with uh, custom voices we built for them. And then Charisma, you want to be able to, you, you want to be interoperable. So whatever the, wherever your customers are, you need to be there too, whether that's web, mobile, or 3D platforms, and across multiple languages. And that language, by the way, feeds into the central piece of automated workflow, because you don't want to have to write a, a script in, in English, let's say, and then have it manually translated into multiple languages. There is an automated workflow of that, which, uh, which allows those rights to you automatically create the, the new content into a graph form. So that's the key bit is, is make, maintaining the, the, the format of the translation and then allow the human to do the last mile just to make sure that it's okay. So all of these things, you know, this is balance between AI and, and human intervention that we're very keen to, to exploit. And then finally, really for us, the real showcase that we are about to announce properly this month in July, and hopefully will launch by Christmas, is, uh, is, is a full length 
you know, full length immersive experience based on, on all of this technology. And for this, we chose John Wyndham's title. He wrote uh, Dare the Triffids. So we, we licensed uh, his book, The Kraken Wakes, um, which is an epic sci-fi sort of environmental thriller. And we are adapting that into immersive form. As you can see, you know, there are over 30 characters in, in that title, um, all of whom you can talk to and all of whom, depending on what you say to who, the other ones may change their view of you as well. So all of these elements of, you know, are, 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 are come together in this great jigsaw of technology that we work with. So top five takeaways from me. Uh, yes, there's brand, uh, there's sort of conversation design, but there's brand character design as well. If you're looking at this, think about who your, your character might be, what they look like, how they speak, um, as well as just what they say. For us, it's a, it, engagement is that holy grail. Um, the Q&As are great, but really what you're doing is fending off complaints. Whereas if we can do something which makes people feel positive sentiment towards the brand, that's measured in engagement and is fantastic. Um, and, you know, often overrated or indeed and simultaneously uh, sort of under-recognized is the power of proper good storytelling, because it's how we make sense of the world. It's how we, we, we you, you know, um, start conversations, actually, whether it's just how are you? And the answer to that often is, is, an, is a story of what's happened to them, um, that person. So stories are very important to us as humans. Um, AI, for me, is the massive tsunami that is behind, uh, following on behind, uh, you know, all of the other trends that are hitting tech at the moment, whether they're crypto or metaverses or NFTs. It is AI which is the cause and automation which is the effect. And whether you're a table manufacturer, you know, or a chef or a digital marketer, AI is going to be influencing your lives in the next uh, year if it has not already. And finally, the metaverse is a big deal. Games are interesting because they tend to start and finish. The metaverse is on 24 by 7. It is a persistent world. And, um, and our, our, we're very bullish on, on this particular piece. It's an evolution. It's not revolution. We did a lot of work in Second Life, so we saw how that's rising uh, as, a, uh, as a piece of technology and as a consumer proposition, as a brand proposition. Uh, we built all the worlds back in the day for Accenture worldwide and, and uh, you know, did anything from parkour games through to, um, to Q&A and HR interviews. And the, the, the analytics we saw from that are that, people, are that people enjoy being in these spaces. They learn a lot from it. Um, and they enjoy having the alter egos and, 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 and living a sort of playful version of themselves. So our view is as technology and broadband and, uh, and these technologies rise, then the metaverse is going to be, um, as Virginia alluded to, the internet in 3D, which is how we see it. So that's our, our view at the moment. Uh, thank you very much for listening uh, so far, and I will pass back to Virginia. Thank you, Guy. Um, yeah, bit of a mind blower that one. Um, so yeah, I, I guess the summary that we wanted to leave you with: appreciate the fact that um, you know you've, you've we've given you've given us half an hour of your uh, your good attention. Um, it's really just to say that the world is now opening up to a whole range of creativity with tools and technologies that that previously were not available to us um, as marketers, but we can now have full access to. Um, we can create stories and, and that's actually, you know, we feel it's a real crux point for, for marketers to be able to, to tell those stories, to be able to create those personalised experiences in any language, in any environment, um, and to really unleash our imaginations to, as to how we do that. Um, today, today was really just a glimpse, but if you'd like to find out more, um, we've actually got a QR code for a... Um, a landing page where you can basically sign up for our free interactive sessions um, and those are really where we can give you a little bit more of an experience of how these technologies can work and show in real life. With that I'm handing it back to uh, to Judith. Brilliant, that's great, some food for thought there definitely. Um, so we're now going to have a short Q&A session. So first question we'll start off with um, from a, a viewer who's interested, but where do they start? What are the quickest and easiest ways for them to incorporate meta humans into their marketing? How do we get um, started? How do you get started? Uh, I guess um, 
the best place really is to just um, go out there and get as much information as, as you possibly can. Um, there's a lot of info out on the internet about these metahumans. Um, so I'd, before you, you really start playing around with them, it'd, it'd be good to inform yourself with um, all the relevant knowledge and kind of approach this as you would any sort of marketing exercise really um because you know like um some of my other, well, some of my co-pilots were saying is these these things are yes they, 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 they are assets at the end of the day um and the, they need to be assets of which you can utilize um and how better to know how to utilize them than equip yourself with information so that's that's my take on that Mm. Okay. Anybody want to add anything to us? I was just going to say, I think, you know, for me, I'm not, a, I'm not a creative in particular, but I've been able to download MetaHuman Creator and have a little play. I've had a play with Charisma um, on the app and so on. So just even trying it out for yourself, I think, gives you some of that um, hands-on feel for, for what these things can do. And I think as soon as you start to get some of those experiences for yourself, and we've been fortunate to, to be able to go to things like the um, Unreal Engine, Epic Labs and so on, it just starts those ideas flowing. And I think the ideas is what makes this. It's really exciting to, to just be able to think about the potential for, for how, it can, how it can be used. Okay, um, next question. Can, can any of you give us some examples of some B2B um, campaigns um, and to see how they're being adopted by B2B organisations? Can you think of any initiatives? It's earlier stages, um, to be fair, in B2B, um, but it's starting to happen. So there are some, um, that there have been certainly some, some interactions, for example, uh, some events that have highlighted some of the, the use cases. I think uh, brands like Samsung, um, like Alibaba, they're incorporating metahumans in some of their campaigns and technologies. Um, so they've, effectively, they've taken virtual influences and created a brand uh, image and you know, virtual influencers are not necessarily high quality, high fidelity digital humans. Um, and and there've been many kind of um, characters represented. I mean, you know, a few of us, you know, remember some of these sort of little tools and widgets that have popped up on on earlier versions of Windows. How can I help you? What can I? Where can I point you towards? Those kind of early stage um, iterations, if you like, for. Um, for where this technology sort of sprung from and, and the potential that it goes forward. There's quite a lot of work actually being done in the area of chatbots um, for, for brands and that's, um, as Guy was alluding to, with a customer experience element. Um, so, um, so, yeah, a number of, a number of uh, organizations are actually, um, you know, have built or are bu building out um, a cu customer engagement, customer experience, um, interactions with digital humans effectively being the voice or the face behind the chatbot. So that's quite an exciting uh, yeah. space to explore as well. Um, next question is, um, someone's asking, um, is the development of this um, dependent on the growth of 5G? Um, I can take that uh, because we were on a 5G accelerator last year. Uh, no, it's not actually, because which is which is very good news. Uh, and part of it is that the the um, the way in which a lot of these new digital humans, or not even new, a lot of the, the way that the industry is evolving is to be platform, platform agnostic. So you want to be able to have something that where you have a, an interaction on a mobile, and that mobile, if, if it's not on Wi-Fi, you need to be very aware of data plans for uh, for for a lot of demographics. So these are th these are thoughts which are put into the original thinking around designs for these things um, up to the metahuman style, which needs a chunky PC and, you know, not necessarily 5G, but certainly uh, uh, if you're in a gaming environment, you want that latency to be to be reduced. Um, but I think from a marketing perspective, actually the way that a lot of these designers, certainly the way we do them, is, 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 about access, is around accessibility. And accessibility is broadest sense, um, and data connections is one of those one of those points. Okay, someone's saying here that they work for nature brands. Is it just humans that can be created, or other mammals and birds? Well, they wouldn't be a meta human, would they? Meta <laughs> cartoons. <laughs> no, you can. Well, <laughs> sorry, go. 
I, I, I was just going to point to the nine foot seven uh, alien that I had on my slide uh, called yeah. Stephen Wolf, <laughs> uh, who, granted, is not a particularly good representation of nature. I'll take that. Um, but we do, we yeah, we, we've we've seen a lot of really interesting. Really, uh, the, I tell you what, it's not necessarily specific for this, but the, the Royal Shakespeare Company did a um, did a, a, a production during lockdown, which is virtual, virtual production, where they took an actor and then then that actor turned in morphed into star into sort of star constellations and everything. So the imagination, I would say, it, it's entirely what you want it to be. You could have that actor being a tree, being an animal, being whatever it is. They are absolutely uh, that absolutely is a valid use case and exciting one as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're they're everywhere. I think. Um... I think what's something that would be more familiar would be the meerkats. Um, compare the meerkat. Yeah. Yeah, those, I guess are meta meerkats, aren't they? But um, <laughs> you, yeah. as I said, they're 3D assets. Any, any, anything and everything can be made into a 3D asset uh, these days. Um, it's just finding, again, what, what the application um, of the, um, you know, for the meerkats, it's an annoying TV advert, but stays in your head you remember it every time you need it um you know for another for business um actually we mentioned b2b i know deloitte have revisited they had they, they, they did a, a version of a virtual employee help desk um meta human which wasn't the best um but i think they're looking at it again um and it's actually exciting because yeah deloitte's still i mean Mm. Yeah. Uh, next question how do you determine metahuman personality for brands do you collaborate with brand managers or a psychologist do you want to do that one Ryan? personality <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I can take that one um so like for example like it's what i was saying before you you kind of have to approach um this as a as a branding exercise essentially um so for example um we, we we'll, we're working on a cube meta human um i think we're basing it off james actually he's, he's my co-founder um but you know uh cube as a brand has you know its own tone of voice we have our values um and you know everyone who works with within the company kind of is a reflection of those things so a meta human would be no different um it needs to sound like a key person, look like a key person, um, and communicate, you know, as a key, a key brand, so to speak. So, I, I would approach it as you would a, a branding exercise, um, and really give it the personality and values, and the look um, that you, you need it to have. Okay. So you, you said you're um, in the presentation. Oh, sorry, guy. Just to leave it on that quickly, because because we went through this process with Accenture building theirs in Second Life, so I was mentioning, and that was work, work, it was working with their brand teams. Their brand teams were very good at RGB values and what the logo should look like, this, that, and the other. When we said, are you wood, steel, or glass as a building, or what tone of voice are you? It got a little bit challenging. Uh, I, I I think there are there, there are lessons to be learned from story design, from character design, from Hollywood that come into this, and psychology. Um, mm -hmm. It's a it's a holistic approach. It's good. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Do, do, I've just got one more point, um, if it's okay, because I think going back to the bandwidth question, it occurred to me that obviously the mecca for this is the interactive experience, the the charisma thing. But, you know, you can use digital humans in, in lots of different ways creatively, for example, in, um, you know, brand imagery, in static, in video, in social media. So the interactive experience is the pinnacle, but, but they, you know, a, a normal video is a normal video. Um, and, you know, it's just that sort of creative element of, of how you choose the figure and where. But that, that is obviously isn't bandwidth dependent. So the, the need for bandwidth is, is very much sort of, you know, varied and, and doesn't necessarily have a high impact. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned in the presentation that China were leading the way on this and, and South Korea. Um, how far behind are we in, say, the UK to the way they are? Are we going to be able to catch up quite quickly? And on top of that, how could you predict where we may be in, say, five years' time with something like this? 
<laughs> we did see the pandemic coming, so I, you know, granted we've yeah. made strides in uh, technology since then. But and any any thoughts on that? I, uh, I, I've, I've got a bit of research. Research. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Guy, do you want to say this, Guy? Yeah. Um, it's a very quick answer, and it's the it's the it's the way that I I look at it, which is that we in the UK are two years behind the US and six years behind South Korea. And uh, having just one of our, our CTO came back from a mission to South Korea about two weeks ago, and that sort of bears it out. Uh, in terms of catching up, we need uh, we need more we need more investment in it. You know, that's that's the core of it. Whether it comes from government or VCs or whatever, um, we do tend to do things second rather than first in a lot of ways. But my my core uh, investment focus should would be on AI uh, as a as a catalyst for it. Roy, Virginia, do you want to add to that? I, I would say that it's an opportunity for um, forward-looking brands uh, and marketers who want to uh, to get an early footprint in this area. I mean, the metaverse, as we've talked about, is going to be one of the driving forces, along with AI, um, that's going to be accelerating this um, this you know this this area forward. Um, so yeah, if you want to be a thought leader and if you want to to make your mark, if you want to use some really exciting technology to create um, standout experiences for your customers and your brand with the scalability values that actually are inherent. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time, but yeah, we've, we've got an opportunity to uh, to step forward now. Roy, you're nodding. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, I guess the answer to the question, would we, would we catch up? I, I don't think so. Um, only reason being is, um, like, I, th I think in Asia that the demographic is is different from a cultural point of view because yeah. you know it it's not unusual, for example, in Japan to live another complete life online, um, in con in parallel with your you know normal life. So that I guess that's why the you know, this space um, of technology advances a lot quicker there because people live and breathe the stuff all the time. Um, and maybe the, the question should be, should we shouldn't really be looking to catch up, but really, okay, what does the metaverse, so to speak, mean or look like in the West, you know? Um, because there'd be unique factors that are not present in, in South Korea or China or Japan that are, you know, for example, very normal in the UK. So those are the things I think we should be looking to own. Um, and yeah, it's just, I guess, yeah, just use, use Asia as inspiration. <laughs> you know, yeah, we could, could, could there be any downsides or dark sides that we could sort of spot them identifying and potentially avoid? Or is it all just positive? Um, I mean, with, with any collection of people, um, so, so like, this is referring specifically to the metaverse. Um, there's always room for trouble, um, but like these these worlds have been, you know, they exist in gaming, um, and the game industry has managed to regulate, um, a, you know, and weed out a lot of the the nastiness um, out of it. Um, but I think for yeah, for B for B B two B point of view. Um, yeah, it, it, I guess it would be the same risk as the, you would have if you're engaging in any sort of online community, um, but probably not as bad as it would be with, um, with anything else. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky question. I, I don't know if I've answered that. Anybody want to add to that? <laughs> I was I think, talking I think to someone at the weekend, actually. It was a great mm. barbecue conversation just around whose job is in... Um, uh, it's a niche area in certified identification of, of, of people online, you know, so matching kids to passports or, you know, whatever it may be. And uh, he said that that tends to remove 95% of the toxicity in online communities by removing that anonymity. Uh, mm. And, you know, that was an interesting point because there are, there's a lot of toxicity out there, there is everywhere. Um, but if we can find ways like that to remove it, then fantastic. I, I think also that a lot of brands will probably start by creating their own like miniverse, if you like. So a bit like the Qverse or the, the Qatar Airways thing, you know, you control that environment. That's basically your thing. You can then decide 
uh, you know, who's in it, how they appear and so on. Um, you, in the same way that you would uh, monitor and control any kind of um, community effectively. So, so, so there are, you know, different aspects to this. Obviously, the, the metaverse, you know, people are concerned and there are issues around that, but that's a big thing. Um, we're talking about, you know, applications of a particular type of technology that could be used within the metaverse or even outside of it. So different levels of control will apply in those instances. Okay. I think we've got time for one final um, question because we've been fascinating. Um, we could go on all day with the questions that are coming in. Um, final comments. How close are metahumans to the human mind and will they be as close to and if and will they become as close and if so when and the follow on to that would will computers make their own metahumans one day? <laughs> <laughs> Just to scare everybody. <laughs> that might be a question. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to take that one as a final flourish? <laughs> so there is a, I, I, look, I'm, it's it's wonderful bait, uh, but uh, that that question. Um, the, the clue to me is AGI, which is uh, general is general intelligence of, of artificial intelligence. Uh, in terms of how close that gets to a thinking um, autonomous uh, AI system, whatever that system is, um, it's very debatable as to when that will occur and some people debated whether it will occur estimates anywhere between about four and 20 years if you agree that it does and by that time if it does uh making metahumans won't be our concern it'll be a lot <laughs> bigger than that um but um you know i think that it would be very good for example this early stage to be training a large AI models on real world problems uh, that we that can make this planet a better place, like environmental issues, traffic issues, rather than trying to teach it how to beat humans in games like chess, where beating human is a success uh, criteria. Just a point. Anyone else got anything to add to that? No, I mean, <laughs> to close. But the, big, the bigger questions of life are uh, are always open to, uh, to, to different opinions. But yeah, no, I think what Guy said is, uh, is, is pretty straight up. Yeah. yeah. Right, well, we'll draw it to a close because we all want to go off now and try and create our new uh, improved LinkedIn images. <laughs> so younger version for me um so i'd just like to say sadly that's all we have time for now for our webinar i'd like to say thank you again to virginia roy and guy for their presentations and to the cim southeast group for organizing the event we'll be taking a bit of a break over the summer months from with our webinar express series but we'll be back again on the 6th of september when our east of england group will be hosting successful and fulfilling marketing leadership so that just leaves me to say thank you to you for joining us today and hope that you've enjoyed our webinar. Take care, everyone. Have a lovely summer and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. <laughs>